welcome to this podcast series on The Game Changers, from radical idea to innovative business. Are you wondering how deep tech startups move out of the lab and successfully to market? This series may help to address some of your questions. I'm your host, Aoife Mangan, and in this series, I interview technology experts from many different industries, including health, space, energy. In each episode, we meet with the European Innovation Council Program Manager and listen to their experiences in scaling up European deep tech. In case you haven't heard of the European Innovation Council, which is also known as the EIC, it's Europe's flagship innovation program supporting university-based tech projects and game-changing tech companies or startups. Today, we're discussing a radical innovation in the field of health and biotechnology, which drastically speeds up the testing time for antibiotic resistance for tuberculosis, also known as TB. EMP Diagnostics, the company behind this breakthrough, has acquired joint funding from both the EIC and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Here with us today to discuss the significance of this rapid testing method are Jordanas Arshmaniglou, EIC Program Manager for Health and Biotechnology and also a medical molecular geneticist by training, and Pavan Asalapuram, the co-founder, vice CEO at EMP Diagnostics and a pharmacist and a clinical biotechnologist. A massive warm welcome to you both. Thank you for being here. Jordanus, let's start with you. Could you please begin by giving us some statistics on TB? Just how serious is the situation currently worldwide? And, and Pavan, please feel free to jump in here as well. Tuberculosis is, uh, of course, a known uh, global problem uh, for, for many decades. And is considered actually a curable overall and preventable disease. But we are, in reality, we are still far from that. It's very interesting that according to the WHO statistics, although between 2015 and 2020, the incidence of the disease was falling for, um, at least not known to me, an exact explanation. Uh, right now, this trend was reversed and we have an increase by, by 4%, which is almost 4%, which is quite significant. It was dropping for five years in a row, about 2%, and now it increased 4%. We have, in terms of numbers, uh, about 2 million, 2 million new uh, infections every year. According to numbers, the statistics say that uh, around 4,000 people die uh, every day. Uh, perhaps Bevan knows better these figures than me. The important thing is that, um, for one, to recognize that we have two major types of this disease, which is the active form and, and the non-active form, which is when, when the, the bacteria are what is called the mycobacteria, which are responsible for this disease, are in the latent phase. I'd like to uh, only add to uh, what I just said uh, in terms of statistics that uh, tuberculosis has higher prevalence than very well-known diseases like HIV or malaria. Of course, those are uh, the cause of those are, are viruses. Uh, in, in the case of HIV, it's a virus, but in this case, it's a my mycobacteria. Very good, Jordanas. Do you have anything you'd like to add there, Pavan? Um, yeah, so thank you, Dennis, for, for setting the pace here. As I said, yes, 4,000 people die every day because of tuberculosis. And 10.8 uh, million new infections are, are recorded every year, so to say, which requires about 10 billion US dollars for the control and management of the tuberculosis. And of course, you are absolutely right that no country is safe from tuberculosis. As you can see, one um, in three are undiagnosed. And two in three of, of the patients who are supposed to be multidrug resistant, either they are misdiagnosed or they are not even diagnosed. Um, so, as I said before, no country is safe from tuberculosis. Many parts of the world, including Asia, Africa, and Americas, are does have tuberculosis patients. However, Eastern European regions, including the former USSR states, they have a highest number of multidrug resistant patients. So it's an alarming situation because post-COVID, the tuberculosis incidence has been increased by 19%. So that requires a huge as well as careful attention, not only for the diagnosis of tuberculosis, but also to initiate the correct antibiotic treatment right from the first clinical meeting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both. And, and another question I'll also open to the floor, but I think you've already touched on it there, Pavan. Can you walk us through the challenges we face in treating TB today? 
So today we have a lack of uh, rapid diagnostics that are available in the primary healthcare centers or in the first clinical contact points. So that means that the doctors or the clinicians are enabled to choose the correct antibiotics that are necessary and all that are also uh, effective antibiotics, so to say. So therefore, it's most of the times the clinicians are forced to, to prescribe empirical treatment, which indirectly contributes to the resistance. Therefore, it is a need of the hour that we have to provide the useful as well as proficient diagnostic solutions in the first clinical meetings or the first uh, TB um, hospitals in order to accelerate correct diagnosis so that the doctors can choose the necessary antibiotics. So this is one of the major, major problems. However, thanks to WHO, thanks to uh, philanthropic organizations and also many funding agencies from different countries and also the national TB programs of every country, they are taking uh, measures after realizing the severity of the tuberculosis and also its anti spreading antibiotic resistance that they are promoting uh, and taking measures uh, for, the, for the diagnosis and also initiating a proper treatment, the long-term as well as short-term treatment. And uh, most of the cases, they make it free to the uh, needy. Fantastic. Thank you, Pavan. Anything to add to this, Jordana? Yes. Um, no, very well uh, explained by Pavan. Uh, two uh, points to add from, from my end. Uh, the first one is that um, this challenge differs a lot between uh, developed and developing countries. The developed countries have a low incidence of a disease, and that's understood. So the emphasis on the developed countries is on the treatment, and you focus usually on the contacts of those few patients a few that you have yes, undergoing the active form of the disease. So it makes a lot of sense, and this is where exactly they focus clinically, the uh, active countries, to really know the contacts and follow them clinically, uh, monitor them because uh, that they might need you know, urgent treatment or they might be in a latent phase where they might undergo, uh, they might escalate very rapidly. On the other hand, we, ha we have a high incidence in the developing countries there. Uh, it's understandable that the focus is on the programs that you are trying to monitor the expansion and how the disease spreads across the population. And the emphasis there is on the detection of, uh, of of the cases and really to be able to run programs yeah, and inform inform the people across these usually uh, heavily populated countries with high incidence of the disease. So different trends, I would say, are different emphasis, different focus between developed and developing countries. The second comment is um, all what Pavan said, and I added to that. It um, points to the need of uh, of having a personalized treatment for for this particular disease, which is an alarming situation. We say that we are in the era of personalized medicine, but if one takes into consideration tuberculosis, I, I believe he or she understands even better the need for a personalized approach. And very very final comment, I believe you touched upon that, Pavan, is that there is a problem that with the MDR, the, the, the multi-drug resistance DB that we have in the society, the cost is higher. I, I'm not sure if it's five, six or seven times um, higher, but it's definitely much higher the cost of, of the treatment when, when we're dealing with multi-drug resistance, tuberculosis versus uh, tuberculosis that can, can be treated with uh, the X or the Y antibiotic. Absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. As I said, like, you know, if the patient is susceptible for TB, uh, this person can be treated around 50,000 uh, euros, for example. Uh, and if he develops uh, antibiotic resistance, then the same person would need about 300,000 euros uh, for the, for the uh, treatment. It's huge, bur it's a socioeconomic uh, burden for in any country, for that matter. Clear, clear. Thank you. Thank you both very much for this. Now, Pavan, turning to the solutions. Um, firstly, many congratulations on the introduction of your very important innovation to the world. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, this new testing method and how it tackles the antimicrobial resistance issue that you just referred to? Sure. I'm really happy to talk about this. So what we do at Embed Diagnostics is that we have mastered two different uh, 
diagnostic solutions. One is a molecular test, which is called a padlock probe and rolling circle amplification, and the later biosensors. So and we combined these two innovative technologies together and uh, made a platform called MFlowDX, which stands for Multiflow Diagnostics. In using this diagnostic solution, we can detect the bacteria. We can also detect its antibiotic gene uh, profiles. That means that we identify and also visualize the gene targets that are coding for antibiotic resistance. So that means that we have developed a test cassette as similar to the pregnancy test or a COVID test. By seeing the cassette itself, the technician or the doctor can immediately identify if the patient has developed a TB. If he has developed a TB, if the patient has developed multidrug resistance, and if he has developed multidrug resistance, which antibiotic to give? All these three answers can be visually seen within three hours of after getting the patient sample. So one more thing is that uh, <clears throat> we provide uh, answers in yes or no format, as similar to the COVID test or the pregnancy test. And uh, we have developed uh, the first MD uh, MDR-TB test, which can detect the TB and multidrug resistance in one test. And now we are developing uh, the world's first pre-XDR TB in one test. So that means that we can uh, detect TB and also pre-XDR resistance genotypes in one test. The beauty of this technology is that it is completely customizable. That means that we can either add a target or we can remove a target in approximately two months, more or less. And the beauty of uh, this is that there is no, there is no upfront infrastructure or instruments are needed because we need a simple thermocycler, which is a PCR machine. Now, thanks to COVID that almost all the diagnostic hospitals or the clinics have this PCR machine and exactly this is what we need. Um, so the end user, the labs, they can simply buy the test kits from MPA Diagnostics and use it on their uh, uh, instruments. So there is no upfront installation cost, so to say. So this is what we have developed at uh, MPA Diagnostics. Fantastic, that's very exciting. And, and how exactly has the European Innovation Council supported your company and you on this very exciting journey, Pavan? Uh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, this is a, is a fantastic journey and I really appreciate uh, the recognition uh, given by EAC. And especially, I would like to thank the project manager, uh, Penelope, and also the coordinator and director, uh, Yodinas, for, for this uh, support. Um, so we have applied for the grant and uh, among, uh, I think, 4,000 companies or so, we have been selected as one of the grantees recipients of EAC funding from the European Innovation Council. This has uh, been a very important step in uh, MPA diagnostics history, so to say, uh, having recognized by uh, European Innovation Council, which also prompted us to be seen by Bill and Melinda Gates. So when they were screening for different uh, diagnostic solutions, I think, uh, uh, um, of course, they have uh, identified MPA diagnostics in collaboration with the EAC Council. And now we are so happy that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has funded us or granted money to develop this test to the next level. So that means that today we are using a sputum samples and with the Gates Foundation's uh, contribution and also support, we are now moving our test to next level by much simplifying it further. So that means that now we can test the tuberculosis by using a throat swabs as similar to the COVID. So that means that one can take the tongue swabs, take the sample, put it in a tube, and send it to the labs, and we would be able to test. Fantastic. Thanks to you, Pavan. Now, Yordanis, back to you. Um, this project, has, as Pavan touched upon there, has been supported by two major investors, as we know, the EIC and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Could you talk a little bit about your role as a program manager in connecting EIC companies with co-investors and, and also describe the process um, 
or what happened to bring Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to this particular game-changing innovation? Uh, thanks for the question because it, it gives me the opportunity to talk about something that is not very, very well known to the to the outside world. That uh, EIC is building internally what we call strategic intelligence, and uh, this is gradually growing and. Uh, the MP diagnostics um, is is one of the cases uh, that it helps us understand how to become better in strategic intelligence in house. Since uh, you ask me, uh, the whole this journey started uh, when um, you know Bill Bill uh, Gates Foundation is a very big one. So there is a health uh, division directory, and this has a president. So the president visited us here in Brussels. And uh, the director of EIC, uh, Jean-David Malo, and I, and uh, Keith Sequira, who is in, who in charge of uh, strategy, we, we joined the meeting with the president, and the president brought his people together with him. This is how it started. Uh, there was a previous um, uh, communication between Bill, uh, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and EIC, but the train got on track uh, after that visit. Now, following that, uh, we um, carried out lots of meetings. And it wasn't very easy because we were learning through this process. The first thing to do was to visit their offices in, in London and discuss with them many opportunities that go far beyond uh, tuberculosis and MA diagnostics. So it was an exploratory phase. We met with people from Seattle. In Seattle, there is the accelerator, which is part of the, of the health directory. And we interact a lot with them. We interact a lot with them on, on different areas in health, uh, in the area of infectious diseases. I'm sorry, and through this interaction, it's, uh, I'd like so we met with uh, the person who is in charge of their HIV program, which is quite big. In general, it is known that infectious diseases is a priority for Gates Foundation. So at some point through all this interaction, we send them our, our five best uh, projects that we thought were, were excelling in the field. And they had um, inventions and discoveries very worthwhile to be supported for their further development. And then we ended up with three. And finally, uh, we got, uh, in the, from the last three, we got a message from their Seattle, from the headquarters, that one division of the Gates Foundation in California, the diagnostic division, was interested in one of the three. And that's how it started. What I would like to point out, to emphasize from all this is, is the importance, because Gates has very good scientists on board and has uh, very well thought and prepared and developed um, due diligence in when evaluating projects and new ideas. Uh, the fact that we managed to um, get into a very constructive discussion in this case and hopefully in other cases in the future, it just also was very reassuring about us that we are also building uh, strong intelligence internally. Uh, and this is very good because it can expand to other areas, as I said. And notably, uh, for uh, those that they listen to this uh, interview, I believe uh, it would be uh, worthwhile for them to know that the negotiation phase for uh, MP diagnosis was extremely short. It required one month and a half, and for me, this is like, I, I would say, it's kind of record time in finalizing the deal. So we gave a grant to um, uh, MP Diagnostics, and um, it took only one month and a half for uh, Gates to do the same uh, thing and, and provide them with a second grant, which, you know, totally confirms and uh, um, uh, proves, if you want, that we were, we had the same view, we had the same uh, assessment of the importance of what uh, Pavan and his team have developed, and we're very, really happy about that. Fantastic, thank you, Yordana. This is all we have time for today, folks. So, so a very, very big thank you to both of our panelists, Yordana and Pavan, and of course to all you listeners out there. This brings us to the end of our podcast, part of the series, The Game Changers, from radical idea to innovative business. Until next time.